course politics and economics of the oil market delivered by dr karin kneisel very warm welcome again for this concluding session and now i'm turning this over to you please the floor is yours karin thank you good morning um professor bykov good morning to all the participants who are still on i think we started with something like 80 or 90 and last time i saw we were still 60 something so i'm looking forward to reading 60 something essays and we can also make use of today's uh, session in case there are some very urgent questions on how to draft your paper uh, but uh, as it's written in the syllabus imagine that you are asked by um, um, a magazine, a paper uh, to write a comment on the current situation of the energy market, of the oil market. Uh, you can, of course, go beyond the topics that we have touched upon, uh, or you can elaborate on one of the topics that we have started. Uh, it's up to you, but um, prepare it as if it were a, a, a good, a readable, informative comment for a reader who has no idea at all about the topic or who has a certain background and wants to know more. Where do we stand in June 2020 when it comes to certain topics related to the oil market? So that is more or less the task and I'm very keen to read your papers. Um, last Monday, we uh, stopped uh, somewhere in the middle of the national and international oil companies. Uh, we discussed once more the role of OPEC and today I would like to finish with some ideas, some elements on what kind of scenarios um, can we see when it comes to the oil market. So Ekaterina, I may ask you first to continue with our very few slides that are left from uh, Energy Corporation. Yeah, I put here in, sorry, this is only in, no, no, it's, it's not only in German, it's also in English. <laughs> um, so to mix, to bring in again some more German, because there are many participants who speak excellent German. Um, confrontation or cooperation. Uh, this is a topic that we can nicely discuss through the microcosm of the oil market, because in principle, one would say, well, uh, energy need, requires much more cooperation because on the one hand you have the seller who is interested in in in, in earning money and getting revenues through the commodity be it oil be it gas be it whatever and on the other side you have the consumer who needs this energy in order to uh to have heating cooling industrial transport whatever so uh in principle one would assume energy it's all about cooperation. But we have seen throughout the decades of 20th century, early 21st century, where we are in, actually the topic has often provoked more confrontation than cooperation. In order to preempt co uh, confrontation, in order to make multilateral cooperation work more smoothly, different instruments were developed. OPEC as such has always perceived itself as a forum for coordination, cooperation. When you go on the OPEC website, when you read the logo, it's always cooperation through dialogue, um, stabilization, etc. So uh, this, is, this is a topic that, that comes up again and again. And OPEC as such has developed numerous instruments of, uh, of dialogue. You have the EU OPEC dialogue, you have the China OPEC dialogue, you have the uh, OPEC International Energy Agency dialogue, and now we have this, this format of OPEC plus, which means certain OPEC member states plus 10 non-OPEC uh, states, uh, which are important producers, such as the Russian Federation, such as Oman, such as Norway, because there is a common interest in somehow stabilizing the market. Also the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which from a European vantage point, uh, and I've seen that also in my, was during my time as minister, I've seen it as a teacher, is often neglected. People don't, don't discuss it. It's not on the agenda in a syllabus, but um, ever since its creation in the mid 1990s, I've been following from far away. I never attended any of, of their sessions or workshops, but I've always been following with interest their agenda because it's a very, very interesting uh, setup um, of 
the main producers and the main consumers. Who are the main consumers today? It's all about China, it's all about India on the one side, and then you have the main producers such as um, uh, the Russian Federation, you have uh, important Central Asian countries inside, you have Iran. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, form of cooperation, which says in its uh, founding document, it's all about energy and security. So this nexus is very much highlighted in there. And uh, uh, so cooperation, one would say, one would assume is, is, is needed, uh, but it's not always happening uh, the, the way uh, one, one would like to see it, because in the end, in the very, very end, it's often about, uh, well, how should I say, arbitrary decision making, arbitrary decision shaping, uh, ad hoc uh, emotional decision shaping. We have also seen that how dense uh, the emotional dimension can be. Remember 1973, the perception of OPEC and uh, also what has been going on uh, in spring this year. Uh, for those of you who are interested in, in using your uh, now uh, first insights, uh, also to make your assessments and that might be interesting also for your papers next week, on Tuesday, Wednesday, most probably more on Wednesday, on the 10th of June, um, OPEC Plus will have its video talks, video negotiations. Um, so there will not be a physical meeting in Vienna for uh, uh, COVID-19 reasons, but uh, they will discuss whether they stick to the cuts they decided uh, on in April or whether there will be some, some, some changes more cuts, fewer cuts, we will see. Uh, but this could be an interesting momentum for you and your papers also. Yeah, uh, so we have various forms of dialogues, various fora, um, and uh, inside the European Union, I already mentioned it, let me just highlight it here once again. Um, even so, we do have uh, a commissioner for energy uh, it's, it's mission impossible to fulfill this mandate because there is no such thing as a clear-cut energy policy that has been the commission has been mandated with. Uh, the energy mix remains within the responsibility of the EU member states. And uh, just let me remind you of, of the very deep rifts that we have, not only in the way member states do their energy politics, but in the way they have their energy mix. Um, France, very much into nuclear. Germany, moving out of nuclear, still having some nuclear power stations. Austria, having rejected in the early 1980s to ever think even or for putting into operation a nuclear power station. We have countries that rely a lot on coal in the energy mix, such as Poland, for instance, and uh, how to reconcile all that within the framework of uh, the EU Green Deal and what will happen exactly to this EU Green Deal, we'll still discuss it a little bit later on. Next one, please, Ekaterina. Yeah, international oil companies and national oil companies within the Middle East. Um, the famous technology edge. This is something that the IOCs have always been claiming for themselves, saying, well, uh, the national oil companies, the Saudi Aramcos, uh, the, uh, the Rosneft, etc., etc., you name them, have them. They might, they, of course, they have uh, higher reserves, but we, the international oil companies, we do have the better technology. Uh, now, this uh, has been, this has suffered, I would say, a certain setback with the BP crisis in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, because it became very clear that uh, the engineers of BP were unable to fix a tremendous leak in the Gulf of Mexico for, I think, it lasted from April to, to September, uh, tremendous environmental damage. Uh, so this offshore technology was contested when it comes to, to BP. Uh, several countries had, from that moment on were, were, were a bit skeptical about the, the, the IOC's uh, technical edge. 
And of course, we have also seen that uh, the financial market crisis of 2008 uh, stirred up a lot of things in the sense that uh, um, the implosion of the price system uh, also made life more difficult for many of the IOCs because uh, they had to satisfy their shareholders on the one hand, have enough money for drilling uh, the, 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 the next wells. And, and so, so life was not easy for them. And what we have seen was also the increase in importance of sovereign wealth funds, Staatsfonds. Uh, recruitment, uh, interesting topic in particular also for, for you as an audience who are maybe thinking on um, where could you offer your uh, uh, your your expertise? Uh, let me let me start with uh, with an interesting story. In 2005, I think um, I read an article in the Financial Times, which was very telling. It was three years before the financial crisis. Uh, it was the high times of. Uh, uh, the entertainment, the IT industry, be it Apple, be it Microsoft, etc., uh, working for an oil company, for a dirty oil company, was not really attractive. Um, when you asked by your friends, colleague, uh, family members, whom are you working for, and you would say, well, I'm working for an oil company, you, you, you might have to justify, explain yourself for a long time. Working for an IT company is, is maybe easier. Uh, and uh, BP opened up a regional headquarter in Houston, Texas in 2005. Uh, actually, it was that very headquarter that then had to run uh, the Gulf, uh, the, this, this uh, crisis of 2010, but that was unforeseeable then. Uh, but I read in the Financial Times that um, they had to fill about 200 posts in the headquarters. It was not on drilling wells offshore. It was not the dirty hard work outside of real exploration, of real drilling. It was the, the nice, if you want, uh, office work um, inside the headquarters. And uh, they were looking for about 200 posts to be filled. They had asked several headhunters and they didn't find anybody for the simple reason that the image of the oil industry uh, was tarnished, was bad. And it uh, it wasn't even worse in, in, in 2010 with, with the then crisis. It's even worse maybe today in the, in the light of Friday for Futures demonstrations, etc. cetera. Um, I just mentioned that uh, to, uh, to give you an idea, again, how contested, how highly political, how, how disputed this whole sector is, also from a level of social perception. Uh, and uh, this, I think this holds true for, for many, many countries. And uh, if somebody decides to go into the oil industry, let's assume, um, it, is, uh, it is different to work there than when you go now to an IT company, when you go to a, I don't know, a food sector or whatever because uh, of all what we have said, because of the politics, because of the emotions that are always there. Again, it's not just about supply and demand. It's not just about technical fundamental facts. There's much more to it. And, and that's why recruitment uh, is, is, is a difficult topic. And also recruitment differs from international oil companies to national oil companies. I, I've seen that also a little bit with OMB, which is a half national, it's still 40%, less than half, um, national oil company, energy company. It's not only about oil, it's gas and other forms of energy. Uh, and uh, you can see that there is there's a different atmosphere. So I just wanted to mention that uh, for those of you who are maybe playing with the idea or, or thinking about uh, uh, spending part of your life or your entire life in, in that field. Um, relations between NOCs and IOCs are not always easy to handle and it's really a case-to-case -case, um, situation. We have seen uh, a very well-functioning partnership to give one example between BP and TNK in the Russian Federation. 
despite all the problems that were in the past that of course but that uh, then increased after 2014 uh, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Mr. Dudley, who was CEO of BP until February this year. I met him in 2019, and we discussed a lot uh, the, 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 the perception of, of uh, doing energy business with the Russian Federation, etc. Uh, and it was interesting to listen to him for inter alien for the one reason that he, as a half US, half British, I think he has double nationalities. He's American by birth, but he also has a British citizenship. So a US citizen running the British energy company, his task was to fix BP after all the model of, of uh, this uh, environmental crisis. He fixed it. And also uh, he continued um, uh, despite all the problems with, with the Russian sanctions scheme, etc., he managed to, 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 to organize uh, exploration, etc., in, in, in the Russian Federation for, for this consortium BPT and Key. So also an interesting case study if one wants to study it in an academic um, and an academic title. NOCs, IOCs, they don't always converge with their interests. That's in their nature. But there are many, many occasions where they are simply obliged to cooperate. The ones have maybe the stronger outreach to, uh, to concessions, reserves, and the others sometimes have, sometimes have the technology, sometimes have the capital. It's not always a given. Uh, but uh, again, case by case, one has to look at those. Next one, please. Um, the lockdown that we have seen and that maybe is not yet over, maybe there, 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 there will be some setbacks, etc. Uh, when you read about uh, the crisis in the oil price due to the lockdown, you will find the one or other comment uh, which uh, sums up the current situation in the sense like, is this a prelude? Is this a kind of starting point for a tremendous peak in demand that we might still see because of climate change? CC stands here for climate change. So let me share with you two general streams of thought, schools of thought that I observe for the time being. It, it, it can go beyond that, of course, but, but just to have school, two schools of thought. Uh, there's one on the left here. We see the, the oil demand will simply face problems, struggles. We will have now, school of thought, assumption, even a more rapid shift into renewables. So question marks will we see, will we not see? There will be maybe a growing pressure, sorry, there's a typo, to adopt fossil fuel business even sooner. Um, this is at least... The, the announcement, let's say, whether it stems from the European Commission, whether it stems from the one or the other European government, uh, that's what a Mr. Macron will tell you, that's what a Mrs. Merkel will say in the recovery plans that are now the rescue plans for the EU, given the tremendous economic depression. That's what uh, the Austrian government announces, announces it's not yet taking measures on that. Uh, Will the health crisis remain a priority? Will there be money left for, for other actions? And uh, all that has to be understood, in my eyes, under the title of affordable energy. Because um, it's nice to develop great dreams, plans, uh, green deals, etc. People have to be in a position to afford that. Uh, give us today's mobility, this was more or less the slogan that the Yellow West movement in, in France uh, started two years ago when uh, the, govern, the French government uh, increased um, taxing uh, petrol uh, and uh, people who are relying, dependent on their car in order to get to their work, in order to get at least to the railway station from where to then shuttle to their working place, that was the de-triggering momentum for, uh, for the Yellow West movement, which is not yet over. Uh, and mobility, I always say, is, uh, 
is the bread for 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 protest movements of today. In the past, when people went into the street, they would shout, we are hungry, give us bread. In today's world, it's give us mobility, give us affordability. So one school of thought, other school of thought on the right side, uh, will all the efforts to mitigate, to adapt to climate change, be derailed, be uh, softened by the very cheap oil that we have now? Um, it's the, the, the price is amazingly low. Well, question mark, will it remain that low? Will, will we see a bottleneck sometimes in November next year because there is no investment done right now? Again, big, big question mark. It's just food for thought. Uh, so um, the, 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 the issue is that uh, some governments might say, well, uh, we first of all, we have to move out of the crisis. We have to bring people back to work. This is our first and foremost responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then we can start thinking again, implementing green deals. Uh, I don't want now to, 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 to say this will be the, the, the decision-making of, of, let's say, for instance, now US government, or this will be the decision-making of, of the, the Germans. Very, very difficult to predict. Uh, but uh, just let me bring to your attention the latest figure of US unemployment. I remember in, in March, April, when the lockdown started, um, the first figures were 26 million people out of work in the US. And I said, oh my God, 26 million. Now we are at 40 million people. The recent figures from May in the US is 40 million people out of work. Now, uh, what is the first and foremost priority to develop uh, uh, more green deal strategies? Um, and I'm now speaking of for, for whoever runs for presidency. Or is the first and foremost priority bringing people back to work? And the same holds true for a tiny EU member state like Austria, where we also have the highest unemployment figures since World War II. We haven't seen such an unemployment rise for the last 70 years, 80 years, and this is quite something. So um, schools for thought, lockdown, uh, global depression. Uh, some people claim now is the moment for moving into Green Deal and uh, the, 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 there will not be any more uh, such a demand for oil. And others who say no, thanks to low oil prices, we now have to make use of that in order to, 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 mm. to bring, to, to restart the global economy. Just two ideas, two, two, two schools of thought. Next one, please. And then we can go into the debate. Yeah, that was it, I think. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I that that was, seems yeah. to be... Yeah, 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 this the is the end. I, I didn't yeah. put the, the whole thing off of thank you for your attention, etc. cetera. Uh, please, uh, first of all, thank you to Ekaterina. And uh, the floor is yours. Whoever wants to contribute has a question. Um, looking forward to hearing you. Guys, please speak up if you have questions. Mm. Seems to be no questions. No immediate questions. How it come? How it come at all? Where's Marite? Don't know. <laughs> In his Portugal dreams somewhere. Good. Well, perhaps so if, perhaps have... uh, if I may? Please. Sure. Well, uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Knessel. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, well, I was wondering how you would assess the role of corporate social responsibility mm. of uh, the great, the greatest uh, oil and gas companies. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, whenever you open the website of, uh, of a company, of a big company today, one very important section is in the first page, uh, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Uh, companies have been investing in that aspect at least over the last 10 years. Many efforts, uh, consultancy, etc. 
And above all, it holds true for the energy companies. As mentioned um, beforehand, oil companies, gas companies have turned into energy companies. They all make their communication through the image of turning green, of contributing to the environment, of thinking about the next generation, sustainability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not anymore the dirty oil company that um, that has been suffering from its tarnished image through boycotts. Royal Dutch Shell has a story to tell about that. So it happened to BP against all odds. Uh, and uh, this, this, this is a very important topic. It's one of the key, key issues for energy companies because whenever an environmental disaster happens and BP is, is, the, is the best example at stake, 2010, Gulf of Mexico crisis, uh, your market uh, price, your, your, the, the, the shares are going down and BP in April 2010, I think they lost by 25% within days, weeks. Uh, they were even, there, was even, there was even rumor that they might be bought by a, a competitor. So uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility, is a key issue for many of those. Um, now, when you scratch, uh, you can say what well, some mean it and do the utmost to make it happen. And some uh, are very good at PR communicating, but little happens below the surface. Uh, again, it's a case by case uh, situation. Uh, but companies have understood that they have to, to care about it. Now, uh, when you are a stock market listed international oil company, you are prone to criticism. You are prone to, let's say, threats of boycott. Has happened to, to BP recently again, uh, much more than when you are Sinopec or when you are a big Indian oil company, when you are a big um, Malaysian oil company, where maybe this the, the, the public uh, anger may not arise in the same way or may not be mobilized, channeled the same way like it could be done in the United Kingdom. So this is uh, this this remains to be seen. But it's a topic for all these of all, all these companies, not only the energy companies. It goes into uh, the in, in, into many other areas as well. Thank you. Bitte sehr, gerne Nikita. Any further questions? Seems that not. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Oh, sure. Well, you have another nice background today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and Pushkin Museum published uh, this area. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, oh, I can't. Can you hear me? Yeah, now uh, I can hear you. Uh, from the beginning of the course, I just wanted to find out your opinion about the future of the nuclear energy. Is it uh, possible to know, um, yeah. since it's our last uh, lecture? Yeah. yeah. Well, nuclear has an important position in the overall mix. I, I apologize that I have not brought into the course a global view of the global energy mix. We only focused on oil. Um, but actually my fault, I should have shown you at least in one of the sessions, where does nuclear stand? But so thank you for the question. Uh, if I recall correctly, nuclear has a base within the local, within the global energy mix of below 10%. I can't tell you exactly seven, eight, nine, something, but on a global level below 10%. Uh, depending on the country, I mentioned France several times. In France, it has a tremendous role. 80% of electricity production done by nuclear. Austria, zero. Um, United Kingdom will be on the increase again because they will go more nuclear. Uh, it is often a very national decision making why a government decides to go nuclear or to drop nuclear. Um, 
the 1970s uh, were marked by the oil crisis and uh, people shifted to alternatives and nuclear was one of the alternatives, very important one of the alternatives in the 1970s. Then we saw the 1980s with nuclear accidents. In the US, we had Three Mile Island. Uh, on the European continent, we had Chernobyl. Uh, then again, for nuclear, there was, I would say, a more peaceful time. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, several countries of the former Comic-Con, like, um, like, uh, like uh, the Czech Republic, for instance, the situation that I know best as a neighboring country, they abandoned old Soviet nuclear uh, power stations and with, together with Westinghouse or together with the French built new nuclear power stations, very much to the distress of Austria, which said, no, no, we don't want to have any nuclear power station close to Austria. We are afraid of nuclear by and large and we remember Chernobyl. Uh, nevertheless, the Czechs pushed it through and uh, just to give you as a footnote, uh, to, to tell you also how contra full of hypocrisy the Austrian position is on that, 20% of the Austrian energy mix is made up of nuclear through imports. We import electricity from our neighboring countries, such as Slovenia, such as Hungary, such as in particular Czech Republic. So uh, also if we reject nuclear, we rely on nuclear through those imports. So uh, as a government, as a people, you can say, we don't like nuclear, we don't go for it, and you might be praised by civil society on a global level. But in the end, when it comes to daily electricity use, we rely on it. So uh, it's, it's, it's a double-edged situation. Uh, when I look into uh, the big world economy, the People's Republic of China, um, I think about 60 or 70 nuclear power stations are currently built, are currently in the phase of going operative. Important, but at the same time, the People's Republic of China does a lot for renewables, goes a lot, is still a lot dependent on coal, more than 50%, is the number one importer of natural gas, is the number one importer of uh, liquefied gas. So. Uh, everything is big in the name of, of, of Chinese energy needs, and nuclear is one of them, but relatively low compared to other forms of energy. So for the overall energy base, it really depends on who needs it to which extent. And here I would say the French electricity production is among the top while the, uh, the energy, uh, it, it, its overall base is is still relatively low. So to make a very long story short, um, in the, under the title of climate change, you have voices who will say nuclear is one answer, one answer. It's not the answer, but one of the many answers. You will have others who claim, no, no, we don't know what's happening to nuclear waste, etc. And above all, when it comes to nuclear, it's always the risk of is there an option for countries which have nuclear power stations to enrich uranium for military purposes? See Iran. Um, the whole debate about uh, the Iranian nuclear program was uh, the reproach, the accusation by the US, by Israel, etc. Iran is going nuclear in terms of military purposes. Iran always claiming, no, no, we only want it for civilian purpose. In the end, you had uh, this tremendous uh, agreement then, which is now at risk. It's not working. Uh, but this is also something that often enters the debate for countries which are at the threshold. Nobody will discuss that uh, when the Chinese, because they anyway have a nuclear uh, force, military force. But when you have countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and of course Iran saying we go nuclear, there's also often the risk, and what will they do with the enriched uranium? Will they use it? Might they use it for, for, for military purposes? So um, nuclear is, uh, is a topic that keeps people busy on a, on a political level, 
but in the overall energy mix, it does not play such a big role. So I, I assume it will be with us, it will remain with us, uh, but uh, I don't see the world go nuclear in the sense that tomorrow's power production will be much more than 10% of nuclear. Thanks, Sean. Gerne. So, what's about further questions? Elena. That was Elena with multiple backgrounds from Pushkin Museum. <laughs> I don't see any blue hands raised, no information in chat. Does it mean that questions are exhausted? Um, Paola Ticozzi wants yes. to ask something. Paola, please. Um, good morning. Dr. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Thank you for your lecture. Uh, my question is rather a purpose for further discussion. Yes, we have been talking about the, the huge stop caused by the lockdown for the economy, for the, the trade, for the oil market. But this can actually, no, it's not like that. Isn't it that actually this is the only chance for change? Mm -hmm. Because in case we, we, mm, we follow the, the second prescription, the second school of thought, the one saying we should maybe bring back people to work before thinking about green deals. Then isn't it highly likely that the situation will be irreversible? Mm -hmm. Because it's a dependence that is yeah. not only linked to that, but also, let's say, the... the um, companies producing cars, for example, mm. and not only that, that is a hard, um, that is something that leverages the yeah. market uh, yeah. constantly. When I listen to the radio, the, one of the main concerns is about the drop in the, uh, in the car uh, production. Exactly. Yeah. Paola, you brought up a very good thought that we will develop uh, still further on uh, with, with the next presentation, but thank you for putting, so to say, the finger <laughs> into the wound of, um, this two, of, of what you said. If we stick to fossil fuel mix, saying, well, we have to bring people back to work, is it then an irreversible situation? A very good point that you make. And um, to answer it in the following way, uh, as a teacher, as an analyst, it's now quite easy for me to discuss it with you and it's interesting uh, to, to, to highlight this and that. I'm very grateful that I'm not now a decision maker. I, I, I wouldn't know what I would do if I'm now confronted with the situation of such a tremendous unemployment, low oil prices, and on the other hand, a green deal. For what should I go? I, uh, I mean, you really have to weigh the different points and uh, and it's, it's an impossible situation for many. So um, we should also be careful by not condemning or whatever uh, the decision shapers and the decision makers, you know, uh, because it's a very difficult situation. Uh, as an analyst and teacher, uh, I would say um, the um, all forms of energy need commodities, also going into renewable, will keep us busy with certain geopolitical subjects, such as battery production needing lithium. You know, lithium is also produced only in a handful of countries. It's also not the cleanest way it is done. It, it, it needs a lot of water. Uh, battery production is not uh, a very environmentally friendly thing. Will there be innovation? Will we see other forms of, I don't know, commodities that can be used for it? I'm, I'm, I'm not so familiar with that, but I would say uh, the lithium battery is not the answer to all questions right now. The hydro, uh, the hydrogen uh, photovoltaic cell, where will the hydrogen come from? Will it come from 
um, chemical um, transformation of gas or will it come from stored uh, electricity out of wind farms or so on you know it's it's there are different thoughts going on but in the end it's also a question of of affording it and um um i i have written a small piece a few weeks ago which you can see on my website on this automotive industry where i expect that um for the simple reason of economic constraints, many people will decide to continue driving their older car because they are simply not in a position to buy a cleaner, more environmentally friendly car, whatever this car is, you know, whether it's a hydrogen car, an electric car, or, or a cleaner diesel or whatever. This is the situation. So in the end, it really breaks down to what can the consumer afford? How will the consumer move? Uh, current glimpse onto this situation, I can only speak here for Austria, which I watch on a daily level. The use of public transport has, has fallen dramatically in Austria. The Austrians were, until the lockdown, very, um, how should I call it, uh, very uh, tedious, very uh, happy users of public transport. Uh, and now there's a complete breakdown in using public transport for the concern of health. You know, uh, people don't want to be infected in a crowded underground, in a crowded bus and so on. Uh, so um, if there hadn't been that situation, uh, public transport would be more acceptable. There is a crisis with public transport right now. And public transport is an answer in, in, in many, many ways. I mean, whatever type of car you drive, you risk to be stuck in a traffic jam. <laughs> you can't be stuck with your electric car like you can be stuck with a hydrogen car. And this is not to be underestimated. The waste of time, of nerves, of, of GDP uh, by loss of, of, of traffic jams. The answer, I think, is um, in a new form of urbanization, bring back city life go away from suburbia you know we have inherited this suburbia fashion from the united states uh, the city the european city as it was designed and not only the european city the whole same holds true for a city like damascus even more the oriental city the city as such um, people lived and worked in their district and the children went to school in the same district. You could do everything on foot. I mean, one of my favorite cities in the sense of cities is Damascus, because there you could really do everything on foot. You were not in need of a car. Uh, this doesn't hold true for most cities today. Um, you live in suburbia, somewhere outside at the periphery. Why? because people can't afford to live downtown. Uh, when I look at this downtown of Vienna, when I, in the mid 1980s, when I worked downtown, you still had there a, a dry cleaner, you had a fruit shop, you had all kinds of shops where you could do your shopping. Today, it's full of Louis Vuitton and Dolce Gabbana and so on, things you don't buy twice a day. And, uh, the rents have gone up, so people move out of the cities. And it's even worse with Italian cities uh, because they have just become kind of artificial tourism islands in the city and there are not any more people who, who, who do city life. Yeah? So the whole urban atmosphere is gone. And uh, I've always said you have to tackle it from many, many points, not just from how you move, not just from this transport thing is it individual transport is it public transport but also how you run a city and i think here a lot has to be resought uh, unfortunately with rising temperatures and also with the lockdown from what i read in in or, or, or also listen in debates to we will most probably see people even moving more out of cities because one thing that has come clear to many is uh, 
the summers in the cities have become unbearable. So people try to live somewhere. They are happy if they can stay in the suburbia somewhere and have a tiny plastic pool for the children. <clears throat> uh, lockdown in the city was very difficult on 30, 40 square meters. Um, so as long as life is normal and you can go out in the evening and you can assemble with people, you don't need a nice apartment. But when you have an economic, a health situation like you have now, and we don't know whether it will repeat itself, uh, people are thinking of going out into the countryside. So we are here right now on a watershed line of many directions that can be taken. We might even see people moving back, back, back to the countryside. I mean, I, I, I know in Italy you, you can buy whole villages in Sicily for a certain amount of money because these villages are empty. Uh, uh, so in, in, in the end, uh, a lot will have to be rethought how you organize Wi-Fi, how you organize electricity production and so on. Uh, will there be more decentralization for this uh, life in the countryside? And uh, how, how, how that will be handled? But it's about much more than just reinventing the car. Thank you. Thank You're you. most welcome, Paula. Okay. Should we switch to the, the last final? Exactly. Yeah. Please, to the last one. It's a lot about the car. Thank you, Ekaterina. So, we currently see uh, what we just discussed with Paola, the automotive sector. We have a global de depression and we have two political implications, implications sorry, for all those countries which, for which oil production is a very important revenue. We have already discussed it here and there. Let's go into more detail, please. Uh, again, let us let us recall geopolitics. It's there where history meets geography, and it's very interesting to discuss it, to study it through the microcosm of the oil market, because in the end, it's also always about physical access to resources. That's what I would like to recall, draw your attention to again, uh, where you have this need to be physically present. It's often also about military cooperation. Green Deal by the EU, we'll discuss it still briefly. We are in a global depression, no doubt about that. It's a new chapter for the Middle East. Uh, we discussed it uh, already, what will happen to Saudi Arabia, what will happen to other important oil producing countries, how can they stabilize their domestic problems. And above all, that's, that's what I've been uh, writing about three years ago, it's a changing of the guard, China versus US. So what will all that mean in terms of energy scenarios, oil market? Will we stick with the oil market? Will we see something else? And uh, let, let's attack our last session. Please, the next one. Harold Mackinder, the father of modern, or the father of geopolitical studies as such. Um, he was a British geographer who uh, did not use yet the term of geopolitics, but uh, the map that he uh, published in this article um, for the Geographic Journal in 1904 has become famous. You see here Eurasia, the pivot area, the heartland. Uh, he said, who controls the heartland, the Central Asian uh, area, where we have the Caspian Basin, the strategic ellipse we saw in other slides, he who controls that area controls the world. That was, so to say, this geopolitical Eurasian concept of Harold Mackinder. And attention, that was still a long time before we spoke about oil and gas production. It was just about strategic depths. That was uh, the, the, the aspect of his studies. Uh, but ever since it has come up again and again, it uh, was discussed by the Americans, it was discussed by the, by the Russians, Eurasian um, um, Union, etc. And it's also discussed by the Chinese a lot. The BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, has a lot, but a real lot to do with this pilot area, this Central Asian uh, topic. The next one, please. 
Uh, sorry to continue what I just, what Paula uh, in her question uh, raised and what I would like to continue in our discussion. Will we see an end of the combustion engine? The way the automotive industry has been working ever since early 20th century. Uh, the, the principle of the combustion engine is still the same. The same uh, Mr. Otto and Mr. Diesel and Mr. Bosch and all those uh, uh, inventors of, of late 19th, early 20th century developed. It's still there. It's, it has been sophisticated, but in its principle, it's still the same old combustion engine. And there's a lot of talk whether this combustion engine will be replaced by some other form of technology. There's a huge uncertainty in the automotive branch, number one. And we speak here of five to eight million employment. Sorry, I forgot to put here Europe. I'm speaking of Europe. Uh, I'm not. It, I've not. Uh, it's, I'm not uh, referring to data in uh, in Russia, Asia, etc. So it's a bit Eurocentric this this um, this slide. Uh, but I mention it for the simple reason that the automotive industry is one of the last key industries remaining in the European Union. Textile has gone uh, heavy heavy industry like metal, etc. is gone. The car industry still remains. Germany is one big car cluster. The Germany success story is a car success story. Plus, we have this huge supply industry in Central Europe, from Bosnia to Austria, from Romania to, to Slovakia. Uh, Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia, is often called the Detroit of Central Europe. And uh, just like it happened to Detroit in, in, in North America, uh, it could turn into a, into a museum. So Dieselgate, Volkswagen, many other scandals, we have seen it, uh, is, is, is a big challenge. The US company by Elon Musk, Tesla, is it the one that will replace the others or will Tesla still be replaced? Uh, we, will, we will see. Where will the car of the future be designed and produced? Uh, I often say it will be designed in China and produced on the African continent for the simple reason that there you have a market, there you still have de demand. And uh, we come back to the question initially discussed, uh, what will the EU Green Deal mean for car producers? What will the current dramatic global depression mean? Will, will it be sufficient to, uh, to, to, to have people get uh, a kind of bonus when they buy a, a new form of car? Will that be sufficient? Will people be able to afford that? Is buying a car maybe the last problem people have right now because they have to think how to survive uh, paying the rents for the next month? Lots of problems. Please, the next one. So uh, the growth in oil demand, uh, you can see it's all about um, transportation, road transportation, other forms of transportation. Uh, this is the main topic. Of course, also petrochemical has a, has a role, electricity production, but transport, mobility, be it aviation, be it road, be it maritime transport, all that is driven by oil, by kerosene, by petrol, gasoline. So uh, the demand development, uh, we had a demand in 2018 of nearly uh, 99 million barrels of oil. Remember, we started this year with 100 million barrels. We are now with 90 because of the cuts, because of uh, the global lockdown, the, the, the inexistence of demand. Will we see a demand in four years from now going up to 104? Remains to be seen, but mobility is the main driver. Please, the next one. Uh, again, here on that, you'll see also inside the OECD region, uh, figures of the past, figures of the future. The figures of the future are in violet, the figures uh, for 2040, and you see a drop. You see a drop, a tremendous drop in road transport oil demand. Why? Because there is a lot of talk already about moving out of the combustion engine. It's not only talk, 
we have seen normative obligations, UN Paris Convention on Climate Change, Green Deal with very far-reaching normative uh, uh, pressure. So uh, there will be a drop, but still we will move we will move by cars most probably, and these cars might also most probably be still driven by a combustion engine inter alia. Whether we will completely move out remains to be seen. Please, the next one. Uh, transport. Here I quote from the uh, plans for the European Green Deal. You can read it for yourself. Uh, the very ambitious plans of the European Commission, the very ambitious plan, in particular by President Ursula von der Leyen. It's her project. Uh, it's uh, uh, in, in March, instead of speaking, instead of coordinating EU efforts to, to fight the pandemic, she was busy with presenting her uh, climate change plan. Uh, and she was harshly criticized later on for having completely forgotten about the, the priorities that she should have seized. She apologized. She said we underestimated the COVID crisis. But anyway, uh, we are now in a, in a completely different situation. We are now in a situation how to rescue the European Union, how to rescue the, the euro. Question, what money will be left or will the money be first and foremost invested in green projects? That's at least what the plan foresees, this plan that was presented last week, this plan that has to be reconciled with the 27 member states, and all that by September, because we need, uh, the, the money is needed and uh, EU budget is needed by the end of the year. So in order to make the, give the parliaments of the 27 member states time to, to ratify it, uh, uh, there should be a political decision by September. Very, very difficult task for the German government that takes the EU presidents in, in, in a month because their first and foremost agenda will be budget. And how to, how to answer uh, the global depression with, with stimulation, etc. Next one, please. Um, last summer, I had uh, the pleasure to, to spend uh, uh, at least one day in Torino. I was going from Switzerland to France by bus <laughs> and I stopped in Torino and uh, went to the Automobile Museum. Very, very nice museum. One of the best automobile museums I've been to. What I did not know was that Torino, Fiat, Fabrica Italiana Automobiliaria di Torino, that's what is the abbreviation Fiat, was the number one uh, car production factory before 1914. It was the most modern one and the biggest one in the world. I didn't know that. I thought it would have been, I don't know, Ford, maybe Detroit, because they were already starting. They became then really big in the 1920s. I thought that maybe it was Stuttgart, uh, no, it was Torino. And uh, uh, what we see today is factories that have turned into museums. The Torino factory is inexistent. Torino actually has lost, uh, I think about 20% of its population because of the industrial uh, outsourcing. And uh, I want to, to, to just make that as, a, as an illustration on a larger scale, what I mentioned beforehand. If Europe, the current European Union, loses the car industry, and there's a certain risk that they lose it. It's not due now to the current situation. It started already last years. Yeah. The, the, the German car industry overslept a lot of developments. But there's a risk that factories turn more into museums. And uh, this will have a tremendous impact on the overall uh, setup of, of industry, of society, etc., etc. Please, the next one. European technical leadership is today contested by the Asians, by Tesla. Sorry, I, I didn't finish here my sentence up there. It's, uh, it's, it's unfinished. Um, build a car with more computers 
as uh, the Germans are currently doing. Volkswagen is trying hard to build a competitor to the Tesla. Or, like Tesla does, turn a computer into a car. This is a different approach. And uh, Volkswagen is currently having tremendous problems in bringing its new electric car model on the market. Uh, Mercedes has built uh, a kind of electric mo a car that has uh, a radius of 270 kilometers. That's all. and would cost about 70,000 euros. So uh, not to be competitive with, with a Tesla or with the next Chinese electric car, we'll see. So the technical leadership that was once there where everybody went to Turin, everybody went to Stuttgart, everybody went to Paris to see what the Citroëns, the Peugeots, etc. were doing, these times are gone. Please, the next one. In its world outlook, OPEC says uh, road transportation accounts for today 43% of total demand. Uh, sorry, road transportation will count for 43% of total demand by 2014. So whatever happens to road transportation is, has an important reflection on the oil market. And what we will see is um, what will happen to oil demand, what will happen to transport services, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, how will the car fleets develop? Um, again, will we go electric? Will we go into hydrogen? Will we drop using our individual car and uh, move around with some other technology we don't know yet? Uh, big, big question marks. The next one, please. So uh, the demand in car transportation, you can see it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going down. Uh, we, uh, the road transportation in, inside the OECD countries, that's the traditional industrial countries, including also Japan, Australia, uh, it, it goes down, but it goes up in the next slide, please. It goes up in the non-OECD countries. So in the rest, in the big, big rest of the world. And here, it's not only the Asian market, which is partially saturated. I'm not thinking of India and Malaysia, where there's still room for, for, for more consumption, but I'm thinking in particular of Africa. Next one, please. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, this, this would partially answer also the answer, the question that was beforehand on nuclear. Uh, the gross demand uh, in energy, by and large, you can see that the green is non-OECD, so it's the huge rest of the world. The bluish is uh, the, the, the tr traditional industrial countries. You can see that any kind of energy demand, be it oil, be it nuclear, be it biomass, it's all happening outside of the traditional industrial countries. And this is very interesting to keep in mind. Uh, I've said it at one situation, and pipelines turn east, not so much west. Um, it's often said Europe is such an important market in terms of gas, etc., also for the Russian Federation. Actually, it's we, we see it with the power of Siberia pipeline, uh, which was interrupted now for, for, for maintenance reasons or for whatever other reasons. There's also different comments on that. But the Asian demand is the much more important demand. And the African demand will also have its say. The next one, please. Yeah, pipelines turn once more east. This is a nice little map from the University of Groningen. I've been using it with, uh, over the last years because it shows you how the focus, the centers of history have been moving from the year 1000 of our counting, Anno Domini, uh, it was Asia then. It moved from there to Europe. The 19th century was the European century. In After World War I, and then even more after World War II, it moved into a transatlantic age. 1945, beginning of the transatlantic age. And then you can see, as of the 1980s, 90s, it moves back to Asia. So there's a rapid shift in the center of gravity. And I think this is quite an interesting map. It puts in a nutshell 
what is going on in terms of, uh, well, where the music plays, as we would say in German. Please, the next one. Iran. Uh, Iran is in a quagmire, no doubt about that. Uh, sanctions, uh, Corona crisis, uh, low oil prices, you name it, you have it. The country is in, in a deep, deep dilemma. But still, Iran could always come back as an old new regional power. Uh, it has, I would say, many more ingredients than its Arab neighbors in the Persian Gulf. We will see how all those will be affected by low oil prices, by internal changes. Um, but I always say, do not underestimate Iran. The Iranian outreach in the region is now very strong, not because they have such a, a successful foreign policy, not at all. It's due to the West, uh, all the many interventions that the West has done in Iraq, in, uh, in Syria, uh, and uh, also what is going on in the, in the Persian Gulf by and large that has made Iran stronger. Afghanistan, of course, also the outreach into Afghanistan. Next one, please. I'm going now more quickly. Eastern Mediterranean, offshore drilling. We have not yet mentioned it. We are speaking here about gas, not oil, but just to have it mentioned, this is also a topic at case where we might still see um, certain developments <laughs> of geopolitics. Uh, with the current low oil and gas prices, of course, uh, many of the companies involved face certain problems. Uh, but it's all about the power balance or imbalance between Israel, Lebanon, Israel, Turkey, Northern Cyprus, Republic of Cyprus, EU versus Turkey, Russia in Syria, uh, also Russian companies um, participating in tenders for the offshore drilling. And above all, of course, also China. China, which has a rising presence in Syria and Lebanon, and uh, for which this region, the Eastern Mediterranean, is also interesting in the light of the whole Belt and Road Initiative. So as if this region had not had already enough problems, we now also have the issue of who has the right to drill where and, 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 and all the various problems. It's, 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 it's another large, interesting area. One could discuss it uh, for another hour at least, but just to have it mentioned and, and maybe the one or the other would like to write about it. Please, the next one. Yeah, back to the overall uh, global situation and never seen before in history. The largest world economy is the debtor, the largest world economy for the time being, US, is indebted with the second largest economy, that is China. This has been a situation going on for the last 20, 25 years. It has become very, very acute. Now, once again, China moving out of the lockdown as the first one, maybe going shopping here and there and, 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 and winning the current situation. A trade dispute that could turn into something more in the situation between US and China remains to be seen. Next one, please. The Black Swans. This uh, notion was created by Nicolas Taleb, or Black Swan is, 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 is a notion that existed, but the economist Nicolas Taleb, uh, Lebanese by origin, um, he has written a book, I think it was in 2006 or seven. thereby somehow predicting uh, the financial crisis of 2008. The black swan is a surprise, but and it has a major effect. Uh, and now comes the story. It is turned rational as it could have been expected because data was available, but nobody took it into account. Uh, just let me give you the example of the current pandemic. Uh, in 2019, I had the first and only chance of all to attend the World Economic Forum. There was a roundtable in January 2019 on pandemics. And they discussed then the loss, the financial loss, the human loss of a pandemic will be more or less the same like the one of climate change. The World Economic Forum in its Global Risk Report of 2019 discussed that in detail. So 
we all knew that a pandemic could happen, but uh, somehow we, we we put it out, we left it out, we omitted it of our personnel, of our national agendas, because, well, in theory, you know it can happen, but what, what, what shall you do now? Maybe lessons are learned. Next one, please. Yeah, this was the very last one. Uh, sorry that I went through that now with, with some speed, but uh, it gives us still another 15 minutes to discuss certain topics, and I wanted uh, to, to give us time to, to do that. One of the favorite quotes of Otto von Bismarck, who often is called one of the fathers of geopolitics, of realpolitik, he coined the phrase, History, geography is the constant factor of history. Well, he said it in German. Geographie is the constante der Geschichte. And uh, we have seen it over the last 10 years once again. Geography is back. Uh, it's not about ideology in today's world. It's not about uh, uh, only religious wars and so on. It's once again geography. And this has been underestimated by many in particular inside the European Union, I would say. And uh, my uh, desire as, as, as somebody who is teaching that topic and, and also writing about it is, was always to draw people's attention to the fact that studying geography is a very good basis to have in order to understand international relations because you cannot understand international relations by merely, it's very important, by merely studying um, the, the different theories, ideologies, and so on. You really have to go back to the basics, which is geography and geography shaping history. So I hope that I was not too quick, but... Uh, Otherwise, we would have been stuck with uh, somewhere in the presentation not having enough time. Please, the floor is yours. And thank you very much, Katharina, for... Welcome. For the so I, I still see the blue hand raised by Paula, but I think that Paula... Well, Paula, do you have one more question or oh, have no, you just I forgot think, to unraise it? how it happened. <laughs> okay, so it, it, it's just ha hanging in the list. Any questions, please? Paulina Kochitova wants to ask something. Paulina, the floor is yours, please. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Hello. It was so fruitful. Um, my question, I would like to um, turn our, our eyes and heads uh, from Europe, from Asia, from Middle East to Africa. Mm -hmm. Because in your presentation, in your last presentation, you mentioned it uh, several times. And uh, well, um, in some assumptions in the, the in the automotive industry, Sub-Saharan Africa represents represented at least before the pandemic uh, a rapidly growing growing market, which uh, could approach uh, till ten million, if I'm not mistaken, according to some countries, by uh, 2013. And well, my my question is, uh, what will be the outcome of this very pandemic? Because um maybe that huge demand of, of africa would continue but maybe africa could leap directly to uh the uh, so said the queen technology because they had some um assumption to do that before even before the pandemic mm -hmm. thank you very much for this very important question um let me start with the following i have uh three friends, uh, Austrians, they are much younger than I am. They are in the early 30s, late 30s. But all the three of them have decided to move with their tiny business to Africa. One is in Uganda, one is in Rwanda, one is in Sierra Leone. And we, are in this, we were in contact through the pandemic and they decided to stay there, to continue with the business. They said the situation is bearable. We continue. And interestingly enough, uh, the very early figures we received that like there will be a massacre in on the African continent because of the pandemic, etc. For the time being, let's just say these figures, these predictions proved wrong. Now, question, answer, some say why the, the society is so young. <laughs> uh, why did we have all the deaths in Spain and in Italy? Because of the old aged people who got it and who died from it. Uh, and 
maybe it has some other reasons, immune system, I have no idea, but there was not the big death toll because of, uh, of Corona on the African continent. That's, that's, that's number one. And the other thing, uh, yes, these three of them, they say, we want to work in Africa. We don't see for ourselves a chance under the current circumstances in Austria with our business. The one is in agriculture, the other one is in textile, and one is in consultancy. We want to work here because there is a much more buoyant, there's a much more, how should I say, thirsty society. You know, people are thirsty, are eager, and they want to do something. They want to change something. And uh, this makes the big difference to when you now have a tiny little company and you're stuck in Austria or you're stuck in, in the bureaucracy of the European Union. So you, you want to, to move with your business somewhere. And this is currently happening in some African countries. Now, big issue is uh, there are already other people understood it a long time ago, the Chinese state companies and the Chinese employees uh, in 2004, I, I was in Algeria, that's already more than 15 years ago, and somebody told me there that the Chinese engineers, that they work six days a week for two years, they don't move in and out like the expats from the Netherlands or the United Kingdom, and on the seventh day of their weekend work, they open up their own coffee shop, their own hotel, whatever, so they are, they are very active as entrepreneurs. You have a huge presence of Turkish and Lebanese uh, business people, you know, who have who have discovered also the African business for themselves, and you have a, a middle class, a new middle class, a new African middle class, even in countries that were completely war torn. Think of countries like Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone, when we look back into the 1990s, a failed state. Sierra Leone is functioning again as a state. Surprise. Rwanda, genocide, 1994. The country was a disaster. Today, uh, Rwanda sees itself as the center of digital Africa. Uh, so uh, it's always uh, a mistake to put the entire huge continent into one basket and say Africa is the continent of, of, of misery and draft and, and, and uh, natural disasters. No, there are many, many Africas, and there is a change happening. And uh, that's why I, I don't understand a lot of European governments, and not only those who still have an approach through mercy business, you know, let's do mercy charity activities. It's all still this development aid, instead of really how can you do business in terms of interests not we are the merciful uh, who will now come to the to the people in need and we will tell you how to turn happy but uh, to to have a different approach and uh, maybe there's a younger generation of people who understand that better i have deep respect for those who take the adventure and to say i do it i go for it because it's not easy uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure that things can turn for the better on the African continent. Thank you. You're welcome. So how about other questions? Guys and girls, hello. If I may, I would like to ask a question. Please. Yes, Alexander. Uh, good morning, Dr. Kneissel. Thank you for uh, a series of your lectures. That was very, very informative and very interesting. Thank you. My question is about the relations um, between Russia and the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Oil and gas in relations between the Russian Federation and the EU, it's more a factor of rapprochement or a factor of competition and even maybe disputes? Yeah. It's both. It's both. It really depends on which country you're talking about. When you take uh, uh, 
Nord Stream 2. We briefly touched upon it. I, I wrote a piece which is also available in English and in German on, on my website and I, I sent it to, um, uh, to Gimo. Um, the current situation for Nord Stream 2 is a very, very difficult one uh, because also inside the European Union you have very different approaches. Uh, you have countries like Poland, uh, Baltic countries uh, which oppose it, Denmark opposes it, uh, and you have other countries like Italy, Germany, Austria, and I would say also France, which have a more positive attitude. Um, so in this microcosm of Nord Stream, and Nord Stream 2 in particular right now, will it be finished? Can it be accomplished? One can already see um, these this very different approaches. Um, but um, I would say that it there is a there's definitely um, a certain uh, how should I say there's a there's a new sensitivity which I detect in particular in France saying that please we have to create a new partnership with Russia because the real problem is China. Uh, when I was a minister uh, uh, and I met um, the then British foreign minister, Mr. Hunt, who was the successor to, to Mr. Johnson, he asked me in our first meeting, if you had to put the current situation in a nutshell, how would you describe it? And I said, well, in my eyes, we should not waste our time by antagonizing Russia. The real problem is China. And I said that two years ago. And uh, I think that this is an assessment that is somehow uh, materializing in, 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 in several places. Um, so the, the way how to, to create this partnership will still be, I fear, a very bumpy road. There will still be a lot of... Uh, maybe nasty words, nasty statements, and that always uh, poisons the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is very important and the respectful atmosphere in which we meet. You can be of different opinions, but there should be respect. There should be a correct language uh, that is used. But I am pretty sure that um, there will be, that there is a kind of rational um, um, sensitivity that a partnership is needed, not only through this topic of energy, that is one, but for many other reasons as well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, please, further questions? Um, may I ask a question? Sure, yes, please. please. Uh, thank you, Professor Kneisel, for uh, this lecture. I was uh, wondering, um, maybe more of a general question, um, when uh, during the oil crisis, nuclear became for many countries, uh, so to say, strategic mm -hmm. decision, uh, also in terms of uh, geopolitics. Do you think that in the near future, renewables could also be somehow a strategic decision for uh, many governments, maybe in Europe, but also um, in uh emerging economies. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, renewables have a wide range and uh, constructing a wind farm, constructing a photovoltaic cell requires um, technology, requires efforts and um, huge investments. And when you put all that in opposition to a diesel generator, we are back to the situation that uh, what Marcus Samuel, the founder of Royal Dutch Shell, explained to Winston Churchill more than 100 years ago. He said, oil is relatively cheap, it has a high energy quality, and it's easy to transport, easy to handle. And that has always been the relative advantage of oil, of the diesel generator as such. If you have to construct from one day to the next a hospital, Somewhere in Mali, you will not do it with photovoltaic screens. You will most probably make it run on diesel generators. This, this, this is still happening in, in, in many instances. Um, 
to really to, to go renewable on a large, large scale, as I had uh, answered in the question to Paula beforehand, it's not only a matter of how you run your energy mix, it's also a matter of how you run cities. Will you make people live in suburbia and drive into their, to their working places somewhere downtown or in another suburbia? Or will you organize urban life again in a different way? And it's not only about urban life, it's about running a country in general. Uh, when you go renewable, uh, by nature, by definition of the way renewables are produced in today's setting, you have to decentralize. Which countries are ready to give up central control and let every district, every village, every city run its own energy supply? I don't really see that happen in, in, in various countries because also uh, it means a loss of control by the capital. And that uh, uh, for that, you have to have a, a history of decentral administration. It has, you have to have a history of federalism, of genuine federalism. We don't have it in Austria. You have it much more, let's say, in Germany. Um, and uh, the way this, the, the, the energy is, production is then done is a multi-fold question. It's not only one on technology, it's not only one on geopolitics, it's on administration, it's on urbanization, it's also how you run your agricultural setup. So there are many, many aspects that have to be uh, taken into the whole equation. And uh, again, all the renewables need commodities. Renewables are not innocent by nature. Uh, so you will always need to, to dispute, to buy, to fight for the one or the other commodity. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, the time has almost run out. Any last question? Maybe one administrative question, I'm sorry. Please. Um, okay, please. Uh, uh, one of our colleagues asked, um, I think a week ago, if you could send the slides or if you could make your slides available. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I, I will send it to Dr. Uh, Dr. Koldunova has the slides and uh, please, uh, ah. she, she will as, as, as PDF mm -hmm. as PDF slides so that you don't... Yeah, this, uh, this goes to me and I, I had this administrative note uh, reserved for the very final uh, talk uh, today that I will convert, if uh, current permits, all slides into PDF and only then we'll share with the group. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if I may, I have one uh, more administrative note uh, to you guys in particular. Uh, you have all got, uh, you should have got it for me, the link to the Google Doc folder where uh, we request you to upload your essays by June 10. Once again, here the deadline is June 10. It is indicated in the syllabus. And Please mind that the access to this uh, Google Doc folder is uh, via your emails, which you have uh, indicated uh, when you were registering for this course. Because certain unknown emails are trying to get access to this folder. Please mind that not knowing who it, who it is, I will not be granting the access. Please use your emails, which you have submitted with the form of registration. Uh, if you have questions, technical uh, specifically, because I'm mostly here for this, uh, please uh, email me. Uh, I think you all got uh, organizational emails uh, from my email before this course started. So that's, that's it from my part. So if no, single last question <laughs> then guys and girls please join me in thanking the uh dr kneisel i don't know whether uh dr bykov wishes to to say a couple of concluding remarks Andrei. Well, i would like to thank uh dr kneisel i would like to thank karen for this wonderful series of very engaged and interactive lectures i think for commitment to this course and i'm very hopeful that we'll be able to continue in the same vein 
when uh, the restrictions are lifted and we'll be able sure. to host you here as a visiting guest professor Thank to you. deliver more courses on the issues of interest to our students. This will be a wonderful experience for all of us, including the faculty, of course. I'm sure we'll be able to interact also at the level of the faculty with you. So I'm looking forward to when we all uh, come back to more normal ways but at this level and within the format that has been arranged, you've done, I think, the maximum uh, uh, in terms of the efficiency and uh, engagement and interaction that has been possible as part of this unusual but still uh, quiet, engaging format. Thank you very much. On behalf of everyone, I thank you profusely for the time that you've devoted to this. And please, dear students, join me in thanking Karen once again for this wonderful, wonderful experience. Thank you very much. For me, it was much more than just giving a course. <laughs> it was really also in this time of isolation at home uh, and outreach to the world. And uh, I will miss the Mondays and Thursdays for the next <laughs> <laughs> few weeks. But I hope that, uh, as you said, uh, Andre, um, that we could really meet in nature and um, then um, continue and maybe have a, a key review of what lies ahead on the oil market and all what that means also in, in our daily life. So thank you also to Ekaterina for your permanent um, excellent communication to both of you, whether it was at 11 p.m. in the night or 7 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> you always responded <laughs> in an amazing way. And um, warm regards to each and everybody here who, who is here still on the screen. I do wish to all of us a good reason to remain confident and uh, well, a good sense of humor. Uh, to, to take things uh, for the, the, the way they are for the time being, but that we can remain confident. All the very best. All the very best Thank to you. you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.